Good morning. I am Brad Curry, uh, Senior Area Manager for the SBA. I cover York and Cumberland County. Um, thank you to the Berwick Community Media for hosting us today. Today I have, a, have Bill Card with me. He is the Economic Development Specialist. Uh, he'll be assisting me in the virtual side of things. He's actually up in the Augusta area right now. Uh, Bill will be monitoring the chat and making sure that any questions that you have um, will be addressed. Um, so later we'll be able to open up the mics and let you ask questions uh, virtually. But as things uh, are going on, we're talking, uh, please put your questions in the chat. And then if, uh, if something comes up later, then Bill will be able to address those and we'll have uh, open mics later as well. Um, so this workshop is focused on entrepreneurs and small businesses in Maine. However, if you're not in Maine, uh, please stay with us. Um, it, the material will, excuse me, will still correlate to where you're located at here in the United States. Um, but some of the, the more local things we'll talk about, of course, won't be, but you'll be able to still get those same local assistance um, in your area. And I'll go into that a little bit later. Um, I please ask that you keep your microphones on mute throughout the presentation just to keep down on uh, any background noise. So we have a lot of information that we're going to be covering. Um, Bill, would you like to take a moment to introduce yourself as well? Sure. Good morning, everybody. I'm Bill Card. I'm an economic development specialist with the SBA in Maine, and it's a privilege to be with you this morning and uh, to work with Brad, and we've got quite a bit of information, so I will uh, turn it back over to Brad. All right, excellent. Thank you, Bill. Um, a little bit later, when you come back on to, to help with the chat and take questions and stuff, feel free to open your uh, camera as well so everybody can see it. Uh, so if we can go ahead and get the slides started. So um, everyone has heard of the term knowledge is power. I encourage you to keep this term in mind as well, that knowledge is confidence. The, the more knowledge that you are able to build about your business, about basically anything really in life, I'm not trying to be a life coach or anything, but as far as business goes, the more you know about your business, about your industry, about your community, about your customers, all that kind of stuff, the more you know, the more confident you will be in making the business decisions you need to make to be able to move forward and you know either say, okay, you know, we don't need to do that right now. It's not the best thing for us because you have the knowledge to be able to make that kind of a decision. Or be like, yes, we're going to open a new location here based on X, Y, and Z information because you've gained that knowledge. So knowledge is confidence. Um, there are a lot of important things you should do in business ownership. One is to really rehearse and get down your um, elevator pitch. So most people heard of an elevator pitch when you're talking to somebody just randomly and telling them about your business or yourself. The more you're able to present that and sound confident in what you're saying, the better that'll come across and better first impression they'll have for people. Because you could be talking to a potential client you could be talking to somebody who gets inspired to be an employee, uh, partners, uh, suppliers. You never know exactly who it is that you'll be talking to. So you want to make sure you got that elevator pitch down really well. And through that, the elevator pitch, um, you'll briefly explain what your product or service is, who your target market is, what your business mission is, how you accomplish that mission, and how that positively impacts your community. You can work with an SBA resource partner to help perfect that pitch. We'll talk more about the resource partners in a moment as well. So the SBA, um, we've been in business since 1953. We've been helping businesses since 1953. We are a federal agency. We are free for your assistance to help you start, grow, expand, recover your business. So we're here on all phases of business, not just to get you started, but to help you along the way, help you even figure out how to do your business succession. How are you going to exit your business later? So what is your why? Why do you want to be in business? What is your motivation? What gets you up in the morning to go to your business and continue through the day? A good example that I've learned uh, in recent months 
is a business that is in Biddeford, Maine, called Mia Sorella. It's uh, Mia Sorella's studio, excuse me. Um, Danielle started her business in honor of her sister who passed away, and she restores old furniture, not just to its original beauty, but does something different to it to make it absolutely unique. And that's how she honors her sister, and that's her why she's in business. So kind of keep that in mind as you're trying to put things together for it. Why are you actually doing it? Because if you don't really have a why, you know, if you're just doing it because you want to make money, then you may be successful, but you'll have a lot better chance of being successful if you know what your why is and why you're trying to do it. Why are you trying to do this business? Why do you get up in the morning? You know, who is important to you that you're doing this for? Think about all those types of things because the more motivation you have, the more relentless you will be in your business strategy. So the typical past of business ownership, um, a completely new business creation, uh, that's, you know, you start that up, exactly what it says. Purchasing a existing business, um, ex again, exactly what it says, it's already in business and you buy it out. There's different ways in that uh, step as well. So you could be an employee getting groomed by ownership to eventually take over the business someday. Um, family business, meaning it's a succession. So your parents, your grandparents, and so on, and you plan to go down to your children, your grandchildren, in running and operating that business. And then there's a franchise as well. So franchise, you everybody's heard of, and there's thousands of th franchises, some that you wouldn't even think are a franchise, really. Um, you know, Subway, 7-Elevens, um, those are your standard ones, Jiffy Loop, things like that. Those are franchises, and they have a, a business structure. So they have a handbook, basically, saying this is how you're going to run this business. Sometimes that can be an easy way to get into business if you know you want to be a business owner, but you really don't know what it is that you want to do. A franchise could be a good way to do it because it helps you build yourself and build the character and the uh, structure within yourself by following that, the guidelines of that franchisor. So before you just jump right into business, um, you want to make sure you get your feet a little bit wet, figure out you know, exactly what it is um, that about your business will make it an actual business. So you can have a great idea and be like, ooh, everybody wants this, right? But that is very rarely and pretty much never the case because everybody might want it, but not everybody can afford it. Or everybody's not going to want it. There might just be a specific group of people that want it. And we'll get into talking about your target market uh, in a few minutes as well. So you need to find out, you know, does your business have a clear benefit for a large enough market, market being your customers, to be sustainable? You know, is there enough people that's going to want to buy your product or service to make your business successful? Um, profit potential, again, same along those same lines. A reason to believe. Is your reason, your why, a good reason for other people to believe in your business and what you're doing? Are you making a positive impact into the community so they believe in your business and want to support you? Um, is your business new and different? Is it sustainable? Does it lead to a new stream of products? Are there barriers to entry, being you know laws, uh, regulations that might prevent you from doing it uh, in one way or another, are you able to do a brick and mortar? Are you able to uh, go online and, and present your business that way? Is it comprehensive and internally consistent? Does it flow well or is it just chaotic? How much do you need to do to get your business focused? So some quick distinctions. As I said, your market is your customers and you need to very specifically find out who your customers are. Who specifically out of 100 people will buy your product? Who are those 5 to 10 people that will buy your product or your service from you? And then the industry are other sellers that are in that same space. So they sell basically that same product and provide that same type of entertainment or whatever it is. Um, that is your industry. And you're going to want to look at both 
of those very closely. You want to figure out exactly who it is and who else is doing the same thing. Because when you're doing your market research, you want to find out where those people are. Because if the market is saturated in the area that you're thinking about setting up in, it might not be a good place to set up in. So you will conduct primary and secondary market research to validate your business plan and help determine if there is a legitimate demand for the market for your product or service. So that, the big picture, that target market, I've already mentioned it a couple of times because it is very, very important to know exactly who you're selling your product to. Who they are, where they are, can they afford what you're trying to sell, um, and how can you move forward. And then um, identifying the competitive industry. Again, analyze those competitors. Find out how they're selling, what they're selling, what they're selling it for, you know. Um, go to their websites and figure out what they're doing. So uh, the market research, there's secondary, as I, as I uh, mentioned, and primary. And then there's also a test marketing as well. Um, in some industries, you can do a test market. Sometimes you really can't. So with the secondary market research, this is looking at the industry itself. Google, um, DuckDuckGo, Bing, all those different resources that uh, provide you the ability to research and find out about those different companies that are doing the same thing that you're doing. You can find their annual reports, um, news reports, different things. Also go directly to their website as I mentioned. See what initially catches your eye when you go to their website because that's the same kind of things that can be catching your customers eyes when they go to your website. Pay attention to how much they're selling things for because you should already have an idea of how much it costs you to produce one product or one service and okay you're saying okay it cost me five bucks to do this but they're selling for seven so are they doing something different to where they don't have a very big markup or do they have uh, a lot of volume where they have a lot of sales going out so they can work with a smaller margin which we'll talk about that in a moment as well. Um, your primary market research, that is talking directly to potential customers. You can do focus groups, interviews, surveys, blogs, however you can actually talk to those potential customers or people you know are customers buying that product already. Um, going to the different stores of your competitors, um, talking to different people about the stuff that they're looking at that you're trying to sell as well. Find out what they want, how they want it, and what they're willing to pay for getting what they want and how they want it exactly, right? There's several different ways that you can do market research. If you do a screenshot on, of this slide right here or quickly try to write down those, um, those links, great. And we will be sending these out later today um, in a PDF form so you can still get those, uh, those links. I really want to point out the bottom one there with public libraries. Public libraries, if they're a large enough public library, they will have a business librarian there that has access to multiple databases for you to go in and do market research. You can find out, you know, what other businesses that are in that same space of yours are in that area that you're thinking about setting up. You know, are there, are there suppliers nearby that will help save you money as far as on delivery costs? Because you know, the farther they got to ship, the more it may cost. So if you can find suppliers that are nearby. And it'll also help you find out your, your market. So if you're selling something to do with dog supplies or food or toys, something like that, for example, you can go in and find out how many people buy dog food, for example, you know, um, in a certain area. So how much is being spent on dog food in a certain area will tell you how much people are willing to spend on their dogs in that area. If you're not seeing a lot of people buying a lot of products for dogs and dog food and stuff like that in that area, maybe there's not a big market for it, for example, right? Um, so contacting your public librarian, talking to that business librarian will help you be able to navigate through these different databases to do all this kind of research. Um, there's a gentleman by the name of Miles Roberts at the Portland Public Library that um, can help 
guide you through the process of doing this market research. He does classes and stuff like that for you. And most of the small towns outside of the bigger towns, like Portland, um, have libraries, public libraries, that don't have a public, uh, excuse me, a business librarian. And they do have connections with the larger libraries in the area. So if you're, if you're in Berwick, by, for example, your public library here may have a connection to the Portland Public Library that has that ability. So all you need really is a public library card at your local library and you will be able to find a way to connect with those, uh, those databases. So market research is imperative. As I've already kind of you know, beat this horse pretty well, you really need to find out who your specific market is, who else business-wise sellers are in your competitive space that's doing the same thing, so that you're, you're not getting into a saturated market, that you're not opening up a business in an area where there's no call for it. Um, you wanna make sure you do this market research so you're putting your best foot forward when you go and set up your business and you're selling to people that know that you know want to buy your product. So a few more questions that you want to ask yourself to kind of round out that market research. When you're done doing it, you're going to be able to say, okay, is there a strong market? Yes, there is. Okay, let's keep on going and find out, is there a compelling need? Do people really want your product, as I mentioned before? Um, favorable trends identifying entry points, you know, how are you going to sell it? Are you going to be able to sell it online or will you set up a, a cart down on the city square? You know, how are you going to sell your product? How are you going to get your product or service to those potential customers? Who very precisely are the customers? I, I mentioned that so many times. It's so very, very important. You don't want to waste advertising dollars advertising in a market that is not there. It's best to find out before you spend hundred thousand dollars to get that big huge loan and you just didn't do your market research and you're just wasting money um, how strong an incentive do customers have to give you their money so how are you making that product to fit their needs when you're going through that market research and you're talking to people and finding out what they want you may find out that what you had planned for this product you may have to tweak it differently to meet the needs of the people who want to buy it from you, right? So you want to make it just so they'll give you the maximum amount of money they'll, they're will they willing to give you for that product, the way, they, way it is, the way they want it, and the way they, how they want to get it. Um, what evidence can you provide that the market will grow? So again, you're, you're looking at your industry and your competitors and you're watching how it's been over the years and how it's growing. Does it, is it going to continue to grow? Has it plateaued? Are you getting in at the wrong time to where the fad is almost over and it's about to drop off? You know, you got to find out and make sure that that industry is going to grow. Next slide, please. So once again, <laughs> it's all about the customers. If you don't have a customer, you don't have a business, right? You want to make sure that you have enough people that are interested in your product or your service to make it sustainable. Otherwise, it's a hobby that you're going to be throwing money at. So you want to make sure that you are able to do that market research to be able to make sure you have someone you're selling the product to and you have enough people to sell that product to uh, to be a sustainable business. So uh, economics of a, of a business model, um, if you've taken any college classes and have had to take economics, it can be it can be difficult to stay awake for it, right? Um, I I took some my business uh, management classes and stuff. It was a, a bachelor's of business management a few years back, and it didn't really click for me. I was able to research and find answers, and yeah, okay, get by, and do well on the tests and, and pass the classes and everything. But it wasn't until I got into the SBA and started talking more with business owners and other business classes and just seeing things in operation that it just went, okay, I kind of understand that a little better. So we won't get too in depth on economics because I want everybody to stay awake and stay with me, but um, we'll touch on it a little bit. 
revenue drivers, margins, volumes, operating leverage. Um, these are a few different terms that you'll need to know. So revenue drivers. How many different products or services are you selling? So you may have one product that you can do in a few different variations, or you may have a whole string of different products or services that you can provide. If you're a, a landscaping company, you, know, you could be doing um, tree and bush trimming, you could be cutting the grass, you could also be doing stuff in the winter time as far as clearing snow, you could bring in, be bringing in mulch and flowers and all kinds of different revenue drivers. Margins, that's the difference between how much it costs you to provide or create that product or that service and what you're selling it for. It's the area in between there. So how much you have, it costs you to create it or provide it and then how much they're paying for it. That margin is right there in between. Volume, how many are you selling in a certain period? So you may be looking at a month time frame, a six month time frame, annual time frame. That's, those are the usually your time frames that you're looking at. And how much are you selling in each period? That's your volume. Creating leverage, creating operating leverage. It's a new business will need to maintain a low operating leverage to have a high variable cost model to manage risk and maintain liquidity. So that's basically saying um, having a high volume business is, is a little safer when you're starting out. So we'll talk about high variable costs, high fixed costs in just a moment as well. So Walmart and Neiman Marcus have some of the same products. Walmart sells just about anything that Neiman Marcus sells, but not that brand. Um, they sell tons of different things, different items and and sometimes services there too, because some Walmarts will do automotive things and um, they have lower costs. They have lower prices for you to be able to purchase those products or services because they do a lot of them. They have high volume. So in a month, they may be selling 100,000 products and in a month, Neiman Marcus, who probably sells, you know, 100 products in a month or, or slightly more, but quite a bit less in volume. However, Neiman Marcus has a high margin, a higher profit margin between how much it costs them and how much they're selling it for because you're buying the brand. You're buying that name brand, that status quo, right? Um, so Neiman Marcus is operating a high margin and Walmart's operating on a high volume. So those are the difference. They're both breaking even, they're both higher than breaking even, making a profit. They're doing it with high volume and high margins. Next slide, please. So the operating leverage, um, the operating leverage is the relationship between variable costs and fixed costs. A higher fixed cost model is a higher operating leverage. Higher variable cost model is a low operating leverage. So, and the difference between the two, we're going to go over on the next couple of slides and explain what each one is. Fixed cost. Having a business that has fixed cost or a high fixed cost, your fixed cost being rent, a lease, vehicle payment, mortgage, a loan that you're paying on, anything that you have the same amount that you're paying every month is a fixed cost. So regardless of how many you sell, you still have to pay these costs. With the variable costs, you have a change in direct relationship to your revenue. So the more you sell, the more it costs you. A prime example of this is a bakery. The more cakes you sell, the more it's gonna cost you because there's more ingredients that you need to buy to make those cakes. So that's, that's the variable cost. Everything that you need to create that product or provide that service, those are your variable costs. Um, the question at the bottom, what do you think about utility bills, variable or fixed? Um, it can be either or, really. So depending on the type of industry, the type of business you have, or how you've structured your business to begin with, uh, it could be a fixed cost or a variable cost. 
If you are a manufacturer and you are using electricity a lot within your man, within your factory, um, a lot of heat, a lot of different water coming through to cool systems down or whatever the case may be. If you get a huge order in that you're selling to an overseas buyer, for example, and you really got to knock it out and you, you hired more staff and you have uh, people working overtime, those are all variable costs that are going to increase, right? So those utility bills could go up if you're in that type of situation. If you are a, a business that works out of an office and you're providing consulting and you know, you're just teleworking basically, you're sitting there, you have the lights on, you know, a little bit of water usage throughout the day, then it's probably not going to change much. So that could be a fixed cost because it doesn't change. It's just pretty much the same cost for that office that you pay every month. So implications of operating leverage, the higher the fixed cost, the greater the risk. So the more things that you have to pay each month. So you got, you got a loan on a truck, you got a loan on uh, the house that you're, or the building that you're working out of for your business. Um, any other fixed costs that you have to pay every month, the more that you have, the more of a high fixed cost type of business you'll have and the more money you have to make to be able to pay those bills. So um, the interactions with other variable costs of, your, of the economic model, if you have high fixed costs, you need high volume or high margins, right? So the more you have to pay each month, the more you need to sell to be able to cover those costs or the higher the margin you need to have to cover those costs. So on the next three slides, we're going to be talking about Joe's cup of Joe. Um, Joe, basically, he, he started a coffee cup stand that he brought out on the, onto the corner that he's figured out where the best place is because there's some office buildings around. He catch people coming in to work or coming out to get a coffee break and such, right? So his monthly costs include renting the space because he had to talk to the town about setting up on that specific corner, had to pay a fee to do that. Um, the cart lease payment, because he doesn't own the cart itself outright yet, so he's got that payment. Um, transportation, getting the cart to the location daily because he can't leave it there, so he's got to use his vehicle to and the gas to get it back and forth. Um, utilities such as the gas in the vehicle and um, perhaps propane to heat the coffee up that's in that cart. Um, and insurance. Most businesses, almost every business is going to need some sort of insurance. So he needs his insurance as well because he doesn't need anybody. If somebody gets hurt or spills coffee or, you know, what have you, and they want to sue him, he needs to have that insurance as well to cover those costs. So those are his fixed costs. Those are all seen there uh, up towards the top there. Or excuse me, down at the bottom, I can't really see the slide too well from here. But down at the bottom are all those fixed costs right there, and it talks about the pricing of it. The uh, middle section are the variable costs, you know. The cups, every cup, when you break it down based off of how many he's buying together, breaks it down to um, that unit price of how much the cup costs. You know, how much are the sugars and the coffees and the, the beans, uh, you know, the creamer, all those different things that go into making a cup of coffee. And then up at the top there it talks about the sales, so how many cups he is making. Um, I'm actually going to move forward here just for a second so I can see the slide a little bit better uh, to see the numbers. Um, so here you see price per cup $2, and he had 3,200 cups that he sold, and he had 6,400 total sales. That's the gross volume of revenue that come in, right? Um, the variable costs come out to $2,080, and the per cup margin or gross margin that he needs to cover would be that $4,320 because that's what his total fixed costs were. This one here you see in yellow, the only change to what he's doing is he sold more. You know, he got set up, and you know, a month, six months later, he's reevaluating everything, and he started selling more cups. He sold 800 more cups than the previous month or the previous period that he was looking at. Um, still, $2 a cup, 
you'll see that the food costs, the variable cost there went up a little bit. Now it's 2,600 and his total sales were $8,000. But he was able to make a little bit of a profit compared to that initial month. So he was able to make a little bit of a profit. Now you'll see how he's shifting the levers a little bit. That price per cup, because he's become more popular, people are finding out, oh, Joe's got a really great cup of coffee. You know, he's got some great flavorings you can add in. Or his, his, he's always got a great joke to tell you, you know, he's got a great personality and it's just fun to come out and, and get that cup of coffee from him. So he was able to raise his prices up to $2.25. So raised it up just a quarter. It was two dollars, right? Did, hasn't sold any more, but he raised his his price per cup, and he already made another thousand dollars on top of what he was doing before. His total sales nine thousand dollars, four thousand cups at two and a quarter each, right? But he also, since he started selling more, he was able to buy in a bigger bulk from his supplier. So his his food costs went down. Now his food costs are 48 cents and his cup is only 4 cents. Other supplies they needed are at 8 cents. So those all went down from the previous month because he was able to buy cheaper. And he was also able to sell for more, which really opened up that gap of his margin. So with the same sales, he more than doubled his net profit to $2,280 because he was able to move those levers and increase his sales or his, his uh, amount per cup and decrease his costs. So um, you should be able to see how he was able to do that and make that margin bigger and make a better profit. Hopefully, that's all we're going to do on, on economics. Hopefully that helps you understand a little bit better those different uh, terminology and how to you know, maneuver those levers to maximize your profit for the business. So on this slide here, there's different legal entities and not, not one is, is perfect for every type of business or even if you and somebody else you know have the same business, they may choose a different type of legal entity than you choose because it's, it's, up to, it's really up to you what you feel best, how you, how you feel about your risk involved in the business itself, your personal risk. So, um, sole proprietorship or doing business as, that you are the business itself. So if, um, if something happens, somebody gets hurt, somebody sues the company, they're actually suing you as well personally because you are the business, the business is you. A partnership is the same structure but more than one person. So you have you and your friend or your spouse own the business together and you're consulting and you're going out and you're telling people um, the best way to do this or that for their business or whatever it is they're consulting about. Um, same deal. If somebody gets hurt or sues your business, they are suing you and your partners personally as well because you and your partners are the business. The limited liability partnership and limited liability company, LLC, LLP, um, that is the next step up to where you are separating yourself in a limited fashion from the business. So if the business gets sued, then you aren't getting sued directly, but the business is getting sued. So it's separating you and your personal assets from the business and the business assets. And then the C Corp and the S Corp is the next level up from those LLCs, LLPs, and making it to where they have different um, legal and tax structures. So there may some, be some tax benefits as an S Corp that will be better or more beneficial for your business, the way you're operating, than an LLC or that C Corp, for instance. There's, there's not one magic entity, as I was saying. Not every business that is in the same industry will have the same type of legal entity. It's, it's really up to your preference of your, for, for risk, uh, for the taxes, you know, how you want to operate your business. Um, talking with the resource partners, again, I'll, I'll mention them as well here in a few minutes. They can help give you the information, the knowledge you need to confidently make the decision on what type of legal entity you want to be. Um, 
you can change it, but it's not just willy nilly to be like, oh, okay, I'm going to be a S corp now. Um, you have to file. You have to um, pay fees. If you go from an LLC to an S corp, and you're like, whoa, okay, this is not going to work out the way I want it to for my business. Um, and you talk to the state, you they'll let you go back, but pretty much one time you have to pay another fee. Um, you probably have to wait a certain amount of time before considering you go forward into an S corp or a C corp or something like that again. Um, and there, it can be costly. So make sure you do your research on that. Talk with those uh, resource partners so you can make uh, an educated decision on the type of legal entity you want to have. So obtaining a business license. Um, as I said, uh, this stuff is mainly directly for the people here in Maine. If you go to your state's website, um, you'll be able to find similar things like this. You know, what do you need to do to get specific licensing in, in your state? If you're here in Maine, take a screenshot, write down that link you see up at the top, because that is a great way to find out what licenses you need. And then I added a little bit more to this slide because um, the main department of economic and community development, they have a business answers program. So on the state level of things, as far as, you know, getting registered as an LLC or an S corp or what have you as legal entities, um, different things that are state level laws requirements, then you'll need to go to the state to find out. And you can go right into their business answers program and put in your question and get an answer of how to do what it is you're trying to do on that side of the house things, right? Um, so definitely go to, write down that, uh, that link and you can also Google Maine Department of Economic and Community Development. They have two sections there that uh, one is business, one is community stuff and it's great information on how to, how to get your business started right here in Maine too. They have lots and lots of great information right on that website. So your bail team, your bail team can help you avoid getting yourself and your business into trouble. So, or getting you the, the funds you need. So a banker, you don't necessarily have to um, have a direct relationship with a banker right now if you don't need money. If your business isn't needing money right now, you don't necessarily have to have that type of relationship with a commercial lender. However, if you're, if you're doing things and you got plans within the next two to three years for your business to start, and you're going to need some startup cost uh, funding to cover those costs, or you're looking to expand your business and go here, or you, you have a new uh, order coming in that's going to, you're going to need money for to be able to produce those products so you can get it out and then get paid for it. You're going to probably need a lawyer, or a, excuse me, a uh, commercial lender at that point to get you that kind of funding. So it's always good to have those relationships uh, prior to needing the relationship. So once you know, okay, I'm gonna be opening this new location, I'm looking at doing that, go ahead and start that relationship with the banker. Talk to that commercial lender, say, hey, I don't need the money just yet, I'm not applying right now, but in the next, in the next year I plan to expand and open this up, so I'm still doing that. And that, that already kinda of gets them knowing who you are, it's building that relationship. Uh, an accountant, you may be doing your own accounting um, within your business because you have that, but it's good to know an accountant or a CPA that is, does, does business taxes because the taxes almost change every year, right? So unless you're on top of that, which you may have the time to do that in your business, you may not because you're doing a lot of, wearing a lot of hats within your business. So you may not have the time to stay up on the new tax codes coming out. So it's good to have that relationship with the accountant so when tax time comes around, you already know what your accountant wants to, from you to be able to do your taxes. They know about your business and how you operate. Are you just throwing receipts for everything in a box and giving it to them? Do you have a good spreadsheet? You know, the, That relationship prior to will help them be able to do your taxes more efficiently and effectively for your business. An insurance agent, as I said, everyone's going to want to want insurance for their business for whatever reason. Some businesses are going to need more types of uh, uh, insurance. Having a relationship with that insurance agent is going to let you know what insurance coverage you need. And a lawyer, um, you don't necessarily need to have one on retainer all the time, but if you're going to be in a partnership, for example, 
even if it's with your spouse or your best friend or your army buddy, um, you're going to want to have a partnership agreement and have a lawyer look over that. If uh, you're going to set up a contract with another business that's going to be supplying you with supplies to be able to take their little product and create something else with it, you know, you're going to probably want to have some sort of a, a lawyer look over that contract so you're not getting a bad deal out of it, you know, and it's even for both businesses. So it's good to have um, relationships with each of these types of entities. Um, so before when I was doing this class in person, I had people in the room. Unfortunately, we didn't have uh, people show up in person today. Um, otherwise, I would go around the room and ask people to give me a 15, 30 second elevator pitch on their business idea. Um, we probably have a little bit of time. So if there's somebody, we do have a few people on. If uh, somebody would like to unmute their microphone and tell me what your business idea is, or if you're already in business, it looks like um, uh, Cassie Logan or Candy. If any of you would like to step in, you can definitely give me uh, a verbal elevator pitch if you like. I'm not seeing any hands raised or any mics coming off, so no worries. Um, but keep in mind, that is something you're going to want to perfect, and you're going to want to get that down so that you can talk to people about your business and clearly state what your, what your business does. How are you going to provide them with what you're doing? How are you going to do what you do? For, for, for for-profit businesses, it takes money to make money. So at some point in your business, you're probably going to need money, whether that's going to be coming out of your, your own pocket or some stocks and bonds that you have that you're going to cash in or what have you. But more than likely, at some point, your business is going to need some funding. So sources of financing. On the left side there, personal funds. Like I said, you're, you're reaching out of your bank account and um, other assets that you have, you may be liquidating so you have the money to, to inject into your business to get it started or you know, add on or do whatever it is that your business is trying to do. Traditional bank uh, debt, the loans from the bank, um, exactly that. You go apply for a commercial loan and you take those funds and you have to pay them back with some interest, right? Uh, and an SBA guaranteed loan. So the SBA doesn't actually lend money outside of disaster but we can guarantee those loans. So it takes the risk out of it for those lenders. Uh, crowdsourcing and peer-to-peer -peer networks. Those are your Kickstarter campaigns, for example. A great one is uh, Stars and Stripes Brewing in Freeport, Maine. Uh, it's a marine-owned business where uh, they started in 2019, I believe, 2018. And they did a Kickstarter campaign. And they made a good mission and put their why out there as I was talking before, why they're in business and what they're planning to do to help their community. So they they give a portion of their profits to veteran organizations to help veterans because he's a veteran, his wife's been through, you know, a spouse in the military and everything, and they want to give back. So that's that's how they create meaning for their business. And they had uh I don't know how many people, but it's close to 100 people, I think, or a little bit more, that donated money to them through their Kickstarter campaign. With that, those funds, they will use that as their cash injection to a SBA-guaranteed loan through a local community bank that provided them the, a larger loan to, re, to remodel the space that they wanted to get their business put into in, up in Freeport. Um, so they were able to use that Kickstarter campaign to use, get their cash injection into getting a loan. And they did that also with the resource partner SCORE that helped them put their business plan together and get everything organized to be able to move forward. Um, so that's a good example of the crowdsourcing and peer-to-peer -peer networks. Um, the micro loans, those are, we have micro lenders that provide between uh, $550,000 for those riskier borrowers, so even if you're not able to get an SBA guaranteed loan from the bank because you're, perhaps your, your credit is, is just too terrible or you're not 
um, up to par, basically, to you know, be bankable, then those micro loans can help you become bankable through a small loan, you pay it back, you get another loan, they pay it back, and you help build that credit history. And at the same time, they have mandatory classes that um, get you the knowledge you need to be more bankable. So there's classes on business financing and different things like that that make you more marketable to those larger banks. Then the rest of those on the right-hand side, there are equity involved. So anytime equity, your, your equity lenders are there or investors, you are giving a portion of your business ownership away. So keep that in mind because sometimes it's, you know, it's, it's like Shark Tank, for example, on the angel investors and, and, and venture capitalists and stuff. Um, if somebody wants to just give you money for your business, for 10% ownership, and they're not doing anything to really help your business, you could get a loan to where you can pay it back and still own 100% of your business. But if that person that's giving you $100,000 to invest into your business also has um, the knowledge to help your business grow or the connections to get your product into certain spaces and markets, that could be a really good investment to have coming into your business. So look at, look at that aspect and make sure that um, you're getting the right kind of financing for your business as well. So I talked a little bit about the, the SBA back loans and the micro loans I already kind of mentioned. The, uh, the SBA guarantees can be used for just about anything with your business. So it can be used for the startup costs I mentioned, buying ingredients and supplies and stuff to create your product, provide your service, uh, the equipment you need um, for commercial real estate, or even to export your product and get it over to uh, Canada or over to Europe or China or wherever else that you may find that that's a, there's a market for your product or your service. Uh, next slide. If you could, um, see if you can play that video for me. Around the nation, there are over 500,000 new business startups each month. As a new business startup, funding is one of the first and most important financial decisions a business owner makes. SBA's Lender Match Tool brings together entrepreneurs and SBA lenders to help increase access to capital. There are over 800 lenders in all 50 states that participate in the online referral program. Hear from a small business owner of an auto repair shop in Texas. With the SBA loan, I went from, I think it was 21.99 interest rate all the way down to seven interest rate. We went from paying 25 to three grand a week to paying $400 a week. So that's a big, that's a big cut. Lender Match is a user-friendly, intuitive platform that makes it easier for entrepreneurs to use and connect with potential lenders. For more information, go to www.sba.gov forward slash lender match. So that video talks about Lender Match. Um, Lender Match is a tool where if you don't have a, a bank that you're already working with, because it's best to start with a bank that knows you. You already had that relationship, right, that I mentioned earlier. If you don't have that relationship, you don't know where to start as far as who to, what bank to go to or credit union to go to to get the funding you need for your business, you can use a Lender Match tool. Um, I, I say that it's a lot like lending tree that's for mortgages, but less abrasive. Because <laughs> I, I, I use lending tree one time, and it's a great way to find that, lend, that mortgage lender. But before I even hit enter, I had people calling me and, and saying, hey, you know, we can, we can do this loan for you. Um, it's not that abrasive through lender match. On the back side of it, you have SBA lenders that have the authority to do SBA guaranteed lending just in case you need it. So it's already there. Um, you put in a little bit of information as far as what business you are, you have, where you're at, um, how much money you need, how you're gonna pay it back, do you have a business plan, do you cash flow, all these different types of questions. Um, you fill that information out and you hit submit, and then within one to two days, you'll get a response from a lender that saying, hey, we, we got you through the lender match tool and we're interested in, in talking to you more about perhaps giving you some funding. 
Um, it's not a fishing tool, so if you don't have a business plan put together, you don't know exactly how much money you need um, and how you're going to be able to pay it back, you know, then don't put it in there because you're not going to get a reply. You're not going to get a response from a lender because they, they get two choices when it comes to them and saying um, there's this business that's in this industry that's in a market that that lender has designated the, in, within their parameters for the search to come to them. So they'll get the email and they'll be like, okay, no, this business says they don't have a business plan. Then that tells me that they're not ready to actually get the funding. So they need to go talk to an advisor, a resource partner, and they're going to click no, not interested. If you're ready to apply for a loan and you have a business plan, you have all those details of, of uh, how much money you need and how you're going to pay it back, and you go in there and they're like, okay, yeah, this sounds great. This person sounds ready. It's within the industries that we're looking for and the location that we're looking to support. Yes, we are interested. Those are their choices, yes or no. They hit no, you don't see that they even received it, um, and it just kind of goes away. If they hit yes, then both of you get an email with other the contact information from the other person so you can start reaching out to each other and saying, hey, um, I noticed that you were interested in uh, working with me for my loan, or they might reach out to you first and say, hey, we got you through the system. We'd like to talk to you further. So it's a great way to find that lender that you may not know who to talk to. And that program is not just here in Maine or just in one state. It's across the country. So um, if a bank that is out in California says, hey, I know things are happening on the coast of Maine, and I'm going to put my parameters to find businesses that are looking for funding in these industries out in Maine, and you apply and it fits their parameters, you might be contacted by that bank out in California. You might also be contacted by the local banks, credit unions right here in Maine. Um, we've been talking to the lenders here in Maine um, constantly, telling them, hey, if you're not already on Lender Match, get set up on it so that you get these these loans presented to you as well and, and not have out-of-state bankers coming in and you know funding loans that you could be funding. We actually had our Lender Awards yesterday and celebrated the, the great service that they provide in doing SBA guaranteed loans here in Maine and talked about it there as well. So that uh, if you go to Lender Match, you more than likely will be contacted by somebody here in Maine, but it could be somebody out, out of state as well. So um, I did mention the micro lenders. So before we go into to the exporting stuff here, uh, an SBA guaranteed loan. So that process starts at the bank. Once you're ready to apply for a loan and you already have a bank that you want to talk to or you go into lender match and you go that, way, go that route to get that, that uh, relationship started, um, you apply for the loan. If for some reason that bank says, sorry, your application does not meet our banking policies to approve you at this time, then they can say, okay, however, we are an SBA guaranteed lender and we're going to look at doing an SBA guaranteed loan to still make this happen. What that does is reduce that banker's risk because we're guaranteeing it to a certain percentage. There's 50% guarantees. There's different types of guaranteed loan programs. Um, some have a 50%. Some can do a 90%. It just depends on what those funds are for and your business and the industry and such of how they will choose what loan guarantee to use. But the, the prime part of that is they have to be able to say no to begin with to your application. If they can fund your application, your application is, ooh, bam, 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 got everything we need, we're going to approve it, done deal. If for some reason they can't, a lot of times it's uh, lack of collateral or lack of uh, cash injection or perhaps your credit rating, things like that, will make them say, mm, it's a little too risky for us right like this. So we can't approve it ourselves, but we're going to look at using an SBA guarantee. We'll look at doing that, boom, 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 see if we can do it, see if it matches up, and then that reduces their risk so they can still get you the funds without increasing those interest rates, um, having the short term to get the money back as fast as they can, you know, before, you know, whatever happens because they don't trust you for whatever reason. Because they got that guarantee, the interest rate stays low, 
The terms can be extended a little bit longer, up to 25 years in some cases. Um, and those payments stay low so that you're able, able to put the funds back into your business and not just back into the loan payment, right? So it can really, really help if, if you need to have, the, if you need the funds and you're not able to get them through a conventional loan, uh, an SBA guarantee can definitely, definitely help. So on this slide here, the uh, reimagine your potential as you branch out. So you may be starting your business and find through your market research that a great market for you is in Canada, just over the border. It's not far away, it's only a three hour drive from my house, but you may not think of it as exporting because it's so close, but it is. It's exporting outside the United States into a different country and that could be where your market is when you first start. Or it could be where your market is as you're growing. You, perhaps you've started your business here local and things are going great and you're looking for new markets. Exporting might be one way of doing it. 95% uh, of consumers live outside of the United States. America is a big place land mass wise. Um, and some people never leave the country. Some people travel the world. If you think about it though, you can get lost in our little world right here in the United States in buying, selling, purchasing, and, and everything, and not realize that it's a really big world out there. 95% of customers live outside the United States, so you can find your customers somewhere else easily. 98% of exporters are small, so out of the gross domestic product for the United States, 98% of those businesses that are selling outside of the United States are small businesses. Yet only a third of the export value comes from small businesses. 1% of small businesses export. So with 98% of the businesses in Maine being small, only one of those 1% of those small businesses here in Maine are exporters, for, for example here. Um, the, the more we're able to get small businesses like yourself to be able to sell their product outside the United States, that helps bring in more money to our country from other countries. That's the gross domestic product. The, that helps our economy grow. The more, the more money we have coming in compared to the money we have going out helps our economy grow helps our country be more, be stronger economically. So I've heard several people say I'm, I'm too small or I'm too new to start uh, exporting. And a lot of that comes from not having the knowledge to confidently make the decision to move forward to export. Um, as I said, no, knowledge is confidence. We have resource partners, um, through the Maine International Trade Center and the SBDC, the Small Business Development Center, that Mitzi will help you find those markets. And you're like, where in the world do I even start to consider selling my product overseas? Where, where, where do I do it? You know, they can help you figure out where that market is located. They can help you uh, understand the difference in currencies, um, you know, tariffs, helping you get that product there, finding out where to sell it and how to get it there. Um, SBDC, as I mentioned, they have certified export planners that have taken a class through the SBA to be able to help you put an export plan together. So you have your business plan and then you also have your export plan within that. that will help you understand how you're going to export, where you're going to export to, and all, how you're going to get it there, how you're going to get payment. Um, so we have the partners to help you do it. So. The more knowledgeable you are, the more confident you will be in making that decision to move forward in exporting. Um, finding those buyers internationally, as I said, Mitzi can help you find out where it is, where, where those markets are at. And export funding, um, we have, as I mentioned, those SBA guaranteed loans, we have three of them are for exporting only. And they all have a 90% guarantee to help encourage the lenders to get that funding to you so that you can export your product or your service. And that, cause that just helps the domestic product, helps our country be stronger economically. So I mentioned Mitzi a couple different times. There's a link on here for the Maine International Trade Center, MITC.com. They also 
are the handlers of the STEP program, which is a state trade expansion program. It's a grant program from the SBA, and it's administered by MITSE here in Maine. And there are other locations around the country, not in every single state, but in several other locations that have an organization like the Maine International Trade Center that provide and administer the STEP program where you may be located. So I would encourage you, if you're not here in Maine, to contact your local SBA district office and talk to them about who administers the STEP grant program. Because these funds, you can get up to $20,000 a year, and it's used directly and specifically for the exporting part of your business. It can help you get your business, your product, directly in front of your um, new markets. So, so perhaps Mitzi's found, hey, there's a perfect market in Germany for your product. And there happens to be an expo going on in January. So you want to go there, the step grant funds can help you get there and get your product directly in front of those potential buyers. Your uh, step grant funds can also go towards redesigning your website, for example, so that um, people in another country are able to look at your website in their language and in their, in their currency, for example, and make the, the international sales go through directly to your website, those different things. So there's several different ways that you can use those step grant funds, but it has to be with exporting. It has to do with exporting. You can't get a, a step grant and use it for domestic sales, unless there is an exporting component to it. So, um, as I mentioned, 95% of the customers are outside the United States. Two, that's two-thirds of the world's purchasing power is in foreign countries. So it's a big world out there to be able to possibly sell your product or your service to. Um, those markets might not be around the corner. They might be around the world. Um, you can get more information on the exporting assistance that the SBA provides through sba.gov forward slash exporting. So um, to help increase your chances of getting that loan, uh, whether it's an export guaranteed loan or a direct, you know, no SBA guarantee involved, any kind of commercial business loan, you may need to have a business plan. Or more than likely, you need a business plan. If you've been in business for uh, a few decades and have a great relationship with that business with that banker you may not need to have a business plan because they know you already they know what your track record is they've seen that you've been doing this and that for forever but most of the time you're gonna want to have to, you're gonna have to provide a business plan to get a business loan and what that business plan can do is help you make decisions really because you're looking okay this is what I'm gonna this is what I'm doing this is my mission statement. Um, in six months, I plan to be here. You know, in a year, I plan to be here doing this. So that's going to help you kind of guide yourself and your business. It's a it's a living, breathing document. So you may change it as you go because your your markets might change. COVID might hit, and you may have to veer this way. So your business plan will change over time, and as it's affected by outside sources. Um, but it'll be your communication to suppliers, employees for getting a loan. Um, you may not want to show all parts of your business plan to your employees, but you want to make sure they know what your mission statement is, what your focus is, you know, so they feel empowered because they know what you're trying to do a little more intimately than just standing there at a register, right? Um, the analysis, it'll help you do the critical thinking within your business to, uh, beforehand, right? So before things happen, you already have kind of scoped it out. You know how you're going to react to different things moving forward or how much money you're going to need to be able to cover the cost, you know, six months down the road and stuff. And it's a guide to action to do what you're planning to do and how you're going to get to the, that next step. So these are all the things that are typically in the plan. Your concept, industry description, you know what, what industry you're in, the market analysis to show you've done that research, what type of economic uh, business you're going to be, a high fixed cost, high variable cost, you know, um, marketing strategies, operations, who's all part of your market, your management team, 
the risks and assumptions, that's that part where I was saying you kind of know what's going to happen. If this happens, because it's a possibility, this is how I'm going to react, and then we're going to get around that barrier. You know, what's your timeline for progression? Your financial projections? You know, how much um, you project your sales to be based on what information um, and what your offering is. But the must-haves, concept, market, economics, and your risks and assumptions, um, you, it, those have to be in that plan when you go and apply for, for a loan. They're going to turn around and probably ask you for a little bit more and have that discussion with you on different things. But these are what you want to get started with. And um, as I mentioned, the resource partners before, they, they provide free business advising and mentorship. So before you go and apply for a loan, take your, your business plan that you've started and got these kind of things in, take it to one of those resource partners, have them look over it again, give you that second set of eyes um, for several different reasons. They know what a business plan looks like and what needs to be in it. And they also have relationships with bankers and say, oh, I know this commercial lender that you are talking about applying to that, that bank. She likes to see it this way. She likes things to be in this order, you know? And a lot of them, a lot of the lenders, they know if it's uh, written a certain way or if there's a stamp in there from SBDC, they know, okay, this, is, this plan's been gone through. This, you know, that gives, already gives them that perception that you're, you've done your, your business plan correctly, you know, because it's been stamped off by one of the resource partners. Some of the biggest pitfalls in, in uh, business plans is not it's not being clear what you're trying to do um, you want to make sure that when somebody reads it it's easy to read um, you've gone through the different things and, and you're not just a, a big picture kind of guy and just saying boom this is it and leave out all the details but then you don't want to be overly detailed in it because whoever's looking at it is going to be like i have no idea what you're talking about that's that's too many technical details it's not my my thing and then they just kind of get lost in it. So you don't want to be overly detailed on everything like that. But you don't want to just leave all the details out and have the big picture going. Um, and you want to be real with it. You're not going to be like, hey, first year I'm going to make $7 million. It could be realistic, but if you're not backing it up with facts of how you're going to get to those numbers, then it sounds like it's just throwing numbers out there. So you want to make sure you back up what you're saying to keep it real for the person that's reading it. Is it flexible Is it, or too rigid, you know, on those, like I said, with those uh, risks and assumptions? As you're moving forward, is it, if something happens, how do you get around it? Or is it going to be like, nope, that's, my business is dead if this happens, you know? Or, eh, we'll do this or we'll do that, and it's too flexible and you're just kind of winging it. You want to make sure it flows good and you have good consistency within your business of how you're going to do things. You know, um, the verbiage in the plan in, in your business plan, so it's reading it just makes it a lot easier if you use the same verbiage throughout and not, you know, have this or this. And then they're figuring out, OK, was he actually talking about that? So um, clear, make it real. Not, don't worry about making it too flexible or too rigid. You know, find that in, inner consistency of that. And then the consistency of how you write it and how you explain things within the business plan. So um, we talked about different types of funding before and equity investors. SBA has also vetted some small business investment companies. Next slide, please. I think there's another one. Yes. Um, and so they're already set up their investment companies. They've already been vetted by the SBA to be good working operational companies with a good intent to help small businesses start or grow, expand and stuff like that. So that's what they do is they invest and they get portions of the ownership. And so they're, they're credible and they have that ability to give you the things that you need to help your business grow as well as the funds to, that your business needs to grow. And you can do that by going through um, sba.gov forward slash funding dash program slash investment dash capital uh, to find out more about the, the SBICs. And then another program that we have, which is another grant program, is for research and development. And it's through the Small Business Innovation, Innovation Research or the Small Business Technology Transfer, the SBIR and STTR programs. And these are 
grant programs as well. If you are trying to develop a new technology, um, a product that is so innovative and it's going to change an industry, and these are things that the federal government has put out saying, hey, we need someone to develop this. And that's something you're doing or you're interested in doing. You know you have the capability to do, but you don't have the funds to do it. You can apply for these grants through the SBIR, STTR program and get those funds needed to do that research and development, to bring that to the market space. The, so there's a little bit more information on there. The SBIR.gov, you can get a lot more information on that. There's 11 federal agencies that are participating in the SBIR, STTR program. Um, and in those uh, fundamental uh, in types of industries, there are the typical ones that they're looking at um, that get those kind of grant fundings. MTI, Maine Technology Institute, and there may be a different one in your state or wherever you may be located. Um, just connect your local district office, SBA district office, and ask them about the SBIR, STTR program and who is the host for the program in that area so that they, you can apply. MTI here in Maine will help you put your application together to apply for these grants. They do not approve the grants. They do not decide who gets them, who moves forward in the system and the process and stuff. They just help you put the grant uh, applications together to be submitted. Um, so you can find out through more information through the SBIR or S. Yes, sbir.org, um, I think is what it was, or .gov that was on the other page. And then also through maintechnology.org and talk to them about the programs um, and how to apply. So building capacity as your business develops. Um, this is another avenue of finding funding, like, like exporting was, you know, not your typical set up a business on the street corner and sell to the people walking down the street or coming into your business. Um, finding those different markets in wherever in the world and also finding a different market within the federal government. The SBA works with all federal agencies to award at least 23% of their um, contract dollars to go towards small businesses. Um, annually, more than $200 million are awarded to federal contracts here in Maine. So, um, if you're considering to sell whatever it is that you do to the federal government, there's the possibility of doing so through our resource partners and through the SBA uh, to help you be able to do that. Because it's a big market. It's a huge market. The, S the, the federal government um, buys anything from number two pencils to tomahawk missiles, everything in between. If you're, if you're selling it, the government's probably going to buy it. Or there's a, good, there's a good chance that they're going to buy it, whether it's a product or a service even. Um, it's just about how to do it, and there's, you know, you're looking at, oh, I don't want to mess with the government. There's always a lot of red tape and such, and well, you know, just like exporting, getting the knowledge you need to confidently make the decisions within government contracting, you'll be able to do it. And we at the SBA, uh, through the sba.gov forward slash contracting, get you that kind of information. And then also um, directly from us, we have a, a a staff member here named Jim Pino. He, he is a senior area manager covering Northern Maine, and he's also the government contracting specialist and the 8A program manager here in Maine uh, to help you through the, through the uh, contracting process. We also have other partners um, through PTAC that I'll talk about in a moment as well. But uh, I mentioned the 23%. The 23% the of uh, spending from federal agencies to go towards small business. That also breaks down into other certifications. So you could be a, a self-certified small business and, and look up and meet the demographics of a small business and that be it. Or you can also look and see about uh, fitting into one of four different categories to get additional certifications. The more certifications you have, the more doors you'll open because also there's uh, a 5% of federal contract dollars that's supposed to go towards small disadvantaged businesses in that 8A program that I was mentioning that, that Jim Pino manages here in Maine. And then 5% of federal contract dollars to woman-owned small businesses. 3% towards hub zones, which is a historically underutilized business zone. Prime example here in Maine is Brunswick Landing, um, which used to be a military base, closed down, 
and then it devastated the economy. And so being a hub zone, that attracts people to go there and set their business up there. So then they're either attracting new business, you know, if they have a storefront, or um, paying tax dollars into the city for having their headquarters in that area, you know, whatever you have. So that's another certification. Um, 3% of federal contracting dollars also goes towards service-disabled, better-known businesses. So if you are a female veteran, you can be a certified small business, self-certified. You can be a veteran-owned business. If you have a service-connected disability, you can become the service-disabled, veteran-owned business. And then you also can get the woman-owned small business certification. Each time, that allows a specific uh, purchaser from an agency say say I, I have the budget and I'm buying office supplies and I've already spent you know X amount of dollars towards your business but oh I need to spend five percent towards a uh, woman-owned small business still oh you're a woman-owned small business I can still buy from you more you know or if you're oh you're also a better known small business I can spend another three percent of my budget towards you or more you know towards you for the supplies that I need so it just helps open up those more doors so people can, those agencies can keep buying from you. Having more certifications does that. Okay, and then, uh, so I got ahead of myself on the slide a little bit, but those are the four different um, certifications I just talked about, the 8A, the hub zone, the woman owned, and the service disabled veteran owned. And the service disabled veteran owned program um, also has a new type of uh, process for applying for that certification. Uh, in years past, it was done through the VA, but starting January 1st, we will be doing it here within the SBA. So you'll be applying through the SBA to get that service disabled veteran owned certification. Um, woman owned, they in recent years, they started a new process through that as well, also through the SBA. So you're able to get all of these different certification designations directly through the SBA. And then um, there's the mentor protege program. And this is for any small business that is looking to get into a new competitive space, typically government contracting, where you have a big business that is a prime contractor, and they want to be able to do these jobs and get these contracts that are out there, but they're set aside for specifically for small business. They can't touch those dollars. And then you have small businesses that maybe a little new into government contracting or they don't have the resources or the capacity to do that particular contract that's set aside for those small businesses. So they can partner with a large contracting company to help them get the you know, the people, the, the materials, the knowledge, whatever it is they need to be able to fulfill that job. That mentor company gets money out of it, right? And that protege company gets money out of it, but then they also get the knowledge to be able to grow and move forward performing those types of contracts. Uh, so that's a great program as well if you're looking to uh, get into government contracting, especially, and you're pretty small and you, you have the capabilities of doing things, but you know you just don't have the capacity to do them, then that program might be good for you as well. So uh, in the government contracting space, I mentioned the Procurement Technical Assistance Center, or PTAC, they are not an official resource partner of the SBA, but they provide free advising within the contracting sector. So if you're looking at government contracting, they can help you get registered on SAM.gov. They can also help you uh, apply for those <coughs> certifications and do the bidding and con you know all that, all that comes into play for government contracting on all levels, whether it's federal or all the way down to your local city um, town hall needing to have some work done. Probably like the work that's going on outside the front here where there's a, actually a piece of equipment digging up the ground out front. I'm not sure what they're doing, but more than likely they contracted with the town here and they may have had assistance through the PTAC to be able to do so. So also with government contracting, you may need to have uh, a bond, um, especially if you are a construction type of company you may need to be bonded and if you're fairly new or whatever um, the issues might be that keep you from getting a traditional bond from a 
traditional bonding agent, um, you may have difficulty finding and obtaining that bond you need to be able to get that contract. So the SBA has partnered with different bonding agents across the country that similar to the SBA guaranteed loans where we work with different banks and credit unions, we work with different bonding agents to be able to help you get those bonds. So if you need a bond and you've had trouble getting a bond in the past, the Surety Bond Program can assist you in getting, getting that bond you need for those contracts. Um, the DSBS, I really like to talk about the, the dynamic small business search, mainly because it is a advertisement for your business, basically. Anybody can go into that link right there um, and play around in there. If you know what industry you're in, you can figure out what your uh, NAX code, your North Atlantic Industry Code System, find out what your code is, typically a six-digit number, the more precise the type of product or service you're providing, the bigger that number is going to be. So uh, you can go in and find out what your industry code is and search and find other businesses that are in your area that have registered with the federal government through SAM.gov and see what they're doing. See what they've done on there. Um, you can find people to, if you're a big, if you're doing a job and you're like, oh man, my, the guy, my guy that does a drywall is, is out sick. He's not going to, he's not going to be back in a couple of weeks. I need somebody to come in and do that. You can look to the DSBS and find a contractor that does it. Say, Hey, I need a subcontract for you to come out and do this, you know, or if a bigger company is doing a job and they want to subcontract to you, they can find you through here. Um, and I always suggest, even if you're not planning to contract with the government, you know, you're not a construction company or, or, or what have you to where you will be bidding on some of these types of contracts. I always suggest to go into SAM.gov and register as if you were going to do that because that gives you into the DSBS. So a prime example, we had a, a former colleague with the SBA, her and her husband own a campground in Vermont. And they registered on SAM.gov and it got them a profile on the DSBS. They filled out their capabilities description, which is basically an advertisement for them. Everything that they can do and how they do it right there. And the Vermont National Guard and, uh, and some local police uh, departments had reached out to them, found them through the DSBS and said, hey, we're looking for a location to host this training or this um, unit celebration or what have you. So they weren't contracting with the government to begin with. They weren't really looking to, but they set it out there and the business basically came to them. And then you could also look in there and say, hey, this is a great place for my organization to hold uh, a a Christmas event, or probably not because it's wintertime and a campground, probably not fun in Vermont, but <laughs> but uh, the 4th of July or whatever it is that your business is doing, a retirement uh, ceremony or something like that, hey, you can find it through there. And just like that, whatever it is your business is doing, other businesses, uh, the federal government, prime contractors, anybody can find you through the DSBS. So I would encourage you to register through SAM.gov and then set up your DSBS profile and maintain it. Keep it updated with as your business grows and what your capabilities are. Keep it updated because you never know when somebody might see that and say, oh, let me reach out to these people because they are doing exactly what I need to fill this void. So triumph over adversity. This is disaster assistance stuff. Uh, over the last couple of years, many of you in business or not have probably heard about the PPP and the idle loans. Um, those were specific for uh, the COVID idle, the COVID pandemic is what those ones were for. And it was an ec uh, uh, economic injury disaster loan programs. Outside of that, before COVID, we didn't have, we had economic injury disaster loans. So if something happened, but not directly to you um, physically, but it, it impacted you economically, your business could get uh, economic injury disaster loan. Um, otherwise, it's typically a disaster or a physical type of disaster from hurricanes, floods, fires, you know, um, 
different things that happen. You know, there's a, a mudslide or uh, a pipe burst in the city center that flooded out and closed down the streets, and the, more than 25 different businesses um, had been impacted and had to close down for a certain amount of time or something, and ended up losing thousands of dollars in revenue. Um, the SBA administrator or the president has to deem there to be a disaster declaration. Um, <clears throat> this will help, once that's put in place, businesses and personal residences can apply for dis disaster assistance. So if you own a business and a hurricane comes through and you know wipes out your business, your building gets to, you know destroyed or you know partially destroyed, what have you, or your home, or if you're renting a, an apartment on the bottom floor and it got flooded, whatever the case may be, if, if you live or have a business that's in a dis disaster declared area, you can apply for these types of loans. Um, and like I said, you don't even have to own a business to, to apply for the loans if your home was impacted. And the way those work is just like the IDLE loans you may have heard of, there's a 3.75% interest rate which is pretty darn low, especially compared to where the rates are now, it's low. Um, and typically for a 30 year period as well. So what that does is you, your, your business was damaged, you contact your insurance agent, they say, okay, based off of all, the, of all your coverage and the damages, we're gonna give you $100,000, the damages were 150,000 total, but your coverage is only good for 100,000, you can turn around and apply to the SBA for a disaster loan for that other 50,000 to cover that gap. So with that in mind, um, it is a loan. It's a disaster loan, 3.75%, you have to pay it back, it's not forgivable. Um, so going back to the business plan part of this real quick, when you're building your business plan, if you take, uh, I, heard this, I heard this from a, a Red Cross emergency preparedness briefing back in Colorado years ago. If you take and implement a one day a month where you don't have revenue coming in, but you still have your expenses, so that your revenue minus your expenses, that amount for that one day, you put that aside into an emergency fund. And, you know, for years, nothing's, Nothing's happening to where you're adversely affected by an emergency where you need to dip into that. Then it's building up over time. So if a disaster happens, then you can use your own disaster fund towards covering your expenses for whatever time length or you know covering um, repairs from what the insurance didn't cover and use that opposed to getting a, a loan. But if you don't have that or it's not built up, and you need those funds to help recover your business, the SBA disaster loans are available. So um, increasing your confidence in your business smarts. Uh, knowledge is confidence, as I've been saying, and I've been talking about the resource partners for a little while now. We have four of them. We have the Maine Small Business Development Center, SCORE, the Women's Business Center, and the Veteran Business Outreach Center. The SBDC, SCORE, WBC, VBOC. So those are the acronyms that we use, and we're part of the government, so there's always going to be a lot of acronyms, right? Um, those resource partners are here in Maine and across the country. So anywhere you may be, you can find those resource partners. If you go to sba.gov forward slash local dash assistance, you, it'll bring up a web page, you put in your zip code, and it'll find the closest SBA district office, the closest uh, resource partner of those four as well as a local PTAC representative, the Procurement Technical Assistance Center for the government contracting I mentioned. They'll show you where they're located in reference to your zip code so you can find the closest ones to talk to. Uh, talking about the, the main SBDC, these are the local contact phone numbers uh, and the website. They prefer, all of our resource partners, no matter where you are, prefer that you go to their website to request advising or mentorship so that they can track who they're helping, how they're helping, and what demographics and metrics they're meeting by helping it. So in Maine, mainesbdc.org for the SBDC. SCORE.org is the national website for SCORE. Um, SCORE is an all-volunteer force. 
and there's only a handful of, of employees of SCORE that get paid across the country. Um, usually that's an admin person, like here in Maine, they have an admin person that covers all, all the SCORE chapters across the country here. Uh, you, can, you can contact the SCORE chapters through these numbers here. Um, that's actually a slide I did not update. But um, if you go to maine.score.org, that will be the score chat the score chapters here in Maine to find a, a resources here. And on all of their websites, you'll see the the link to click request advising, request and mentorship. But you'll also see all the different classes that they do um, that are primarily free also here in the state of Maine. Most of the classes and workshops and webinars that our resource partners do here are free. It's not like that across the country because our the resources that are here have also built relationships with um, other organizations like some banks or universities that partially fund them to be able to provide more than just the advising for free. So they can also provide most of their um, workshops or webinars for free too. Um, in other states, they might not have those same capabilities. So you may pay little or no fees for those classes there. The WBC, the Women's Business Center, um, that is also a bad email address or uh, website address. If you Google CEI Main forward slash Women Business Center, you'll be able to get to the Women's Business Center here in Maine as well. But again, you can also go to the uh, sba.gov forward slash local dash assistance and put in your zip code and find uh, the local resources too. Um, and the VBOC, the Veteran Business Outreach Centers, um, those are done regionally. So the main VBOC for New England is located in Rhode Island. Holly Aker is a program manager that assists with um, the regional office. Uh, she's, she's located in Portland, Maine. She also she helps Maine, and she also does some advising in uh, New Hampshire, I believe, as well. Um, so she, if you're a, a veteran or immediate family member of the veteran, um, definitely reach out to the VBOC as well. It can be, be uh, very helpful on finding different things that are specific to veteran-owned businesses. So the online resources, when you think of the federal government, um, in some of the websites you go through, IRS and other things like that, it can be kind of complicated. Our website is pretty, pretty easy to navigate, and they've updated it recently too. So if you go to sba.gov forward slash ME for Maine, um, that'll take you directly to our district office website. And on there, there's a learning center. Um, there's um, a business, uh, another, some other tabs. Um, you'll see some tabs across there say business guide. Then that breaks down into different phases of, of business. So starting, launching, growing, expanding, what it is you need to do within that phase of business to get to the next, it'll, it'll talk about through there. Um, those other drop downs, um, the uh, funding programs, the different types of loan programs out there and ways you can find money through the SBA, including that STEP program, the FBR programs, um, all through that funding program down, uh, drop down there. Um, the learning platforms, that's the, uh, the learning center I mentioned that has I think it's 60 different webinars that are already pre-made that are right there for you to, to look at. So if you're looking to make a business plan but you don't know where to start, there's a 30-minute video right there underneath that link that you can watch and get a good idea of how to get started on that business plan before you go to the resource partner to help you with it. Also on the website, we have a calendar of events. All the, all the events that we are doing here in the state of Maine are going to be on here. Um, this class was posted on there. Uh, any class, not all the classes and um, workshops that our resource partners do will be on here, but most of them are because we've given them the ability to submit their events on our calendar, so it's kind of a one-stop shop. We can't guarantee that all of their events will be there, but most of them will be, so you can come right to here and uh, find out what's happening here in Maine with us and our resource partners. Um, also, there's a little bit farther down on that page, there is an email update section. So you put in your email address and your zip code and you can sign up for the district office here in Maine's newsletter or email update. So you can stay informed about events coming up. Like uh, 
Today is the last day for people to submit their nominations for National Small Business Week awards. So there's been emails going out about that in our newsletter. Um, when we have events like this, they'll be in our newsletter. Different things that are happening within the SBA in Maine, we're putting in our newsletter, and so are the other 68 different, uh, 67, because they're totally 68 district offices, are also uh, putting that kind of information in their newsletters and those email updates. So I encourage you, wherever you're located, to go into the website, put in your, your email address and your zip code, and get signed up for those email updates. So these are those different phases I was talking about under the... Uh, the business guide, um, planning your business, launching, managing, and growing, and what to do in each one of those different ones. So if you're in that planning stage, like right now, more than likely most of you that are on this class today are in that planning stage. You can look through that drop down, find out all the different things you kind of need to do to prepare to start your business. And then how do you actually launch a business? Where are you going to go next? To be in that phase and managing and growing. Yeah, so whatever one you're in, just check it out and see how to get to the next. But uh, our district director is Diane Sturgeon, and then you have uh, Jim Pino, Bill Card, myself, and Keith Lind. Um, David Culp has left our agency. He's over at the Farm Service Agency now. And we do have a new deputy district director, uh, Tim Hobbs, that uh, I need to add to that slide too. But um, if you need to reach out to any of us, um, our contact information is right there. As I said, Jim Pino, he's the the senior area manager covering northern Maine from Bangor North, basically. Uh, Bill Card covers that central area, and then I'll have the southern part of York and Cumberland counties in Maine. Uh, Keith Lind is our public affairs specialist. He's the one also, if you're looking to nominate people for the National Small Business Week Awards, he's our point of contact for that. He does our media, he does our social media, um, he does our calendar, our website, he, he does our pay. He, he, does, he does a lot of the behind-the-scenes stuff for us. Um, so if you need to reach out to any of us, please uh, feel free uh, to find the one that corresponds and reach out. And if you don't know, feel free to reach out to me, and I'll talk with you and get you in, in contact with the right person or, or get the answers you need right then and there. So um, does anybody have any questions? If you have some questions, and uh, Bill, do you have anything in the chat? Do you want to come on and... Well, good morning, folks. Um, unfortunately, there, the chat function was not active. Um, so if anybody has any questions, uh, I would welcome folks to uh, unmute and, and ask them directly. Excellent. Um, anybody that is still on and listening, um, feel free to, to raise your hand or unmute your microphone and, and ask some questions. And as I mentioned that, and as uh, you're kind of formulating your questions, perhaps, um, we, we welcome your feedback on today's program and training. You can also go to sba.gov forward slash feedback and provide any kind of feedback you have on this training on Bill and myself, um, any kind of feedback you basically have on the SBA in general. You can go right there and, and put that in there, good and bad. We like to hear it all. That way we can improve uh, and make things better for you. Just like um, I was telling you about market research and making sure you're talking to your customers and finding out what they want and how they want it, we need your feedback so that we can continue to make a good product for you and continue helping you and, and others in the uh, small business communities. Well, if there are no questions... Um, there, and there's the link right there with the uh, sba.gov forward slash feedback. Um, or you can probably scan it with your phone real quick. Oh, and there is the uh, updated slide for um, contacting us, and it has uh, Tim's information on there as well. Thank you very much for that, Terry. Appreciate it. Um, Bill, do you have anything you would like to, to add to the overall discussion in the class today? Um, sure, and thank you. First, I wanted to thank the Berwick Community Media for uh, and the town for hosting this. This is a uh, a new approach for us, and uh, it I la largely worked really well. And thank you, Brad, for uh, carrying the uh, the load of the of the uh, the, the slides. Uh, it's quite a job there, and uh, I think this is a great model to use for moving forward for. Uh, uh, in-person 
for uh, online and also to save for future use on public access cable. And I, so I want to thank Brad for your initiative in, in setting this up in conjunction with Berwick. And uh, it's a model that I think we will begin to use throughout the state. And so thank you for that. And thank you to the attendees for taking your time today to, uh, to join with us. Thank you, Bill. Um, and again, yes, and I repeat that as well. Thank you, Terry, here at uh, the Berwick Community Media for setting this up. Um, she is also streaming this live on one of the Berwick uh, channels right now and recording it to be aired again at another time and can be shared with other um, public broadcast stations here in the state of Maine also. So, uh, yeah, we, can, we definitely have something going here with uh, our new partnership and look forward to working more with Terry in the future as well. So thank you for, for being here today. And that concludes our, our briefing, our training. If you have any questions, feel free, feel free to reach out to myself or Bill. Um, we'll be happy to help you. Best of luck to you. And we look forward to celebrating your business in the future.